and welcome to this webinar, Transforming the Future of Healthcare. Do cell and gene therapies hold the key? Which is being organized by the European Health Forum Gastein with CSL Bearing. My name is Vivian Parry. I'm a British science writer and broadcaster. And I've watched with amazement as cell and gene therapies have evolved from a faltering start in the 90s to the situation we're in now with a host of innovative solutions for the treatment of serious conditions, many of them rare ones for which there are no current treatments. But these advanced therapies come with a range of scientific, practical, ethical and regulatory challenges. Some, for instance, surrounding safety and durability will require a complete rethink of what affordable patient access means. So this webinar is going to be in two halves. In our first panel, we're going to consider the current status quo. What are the ethical considerations? What are the current challenges and obstacles, both regulatory, scientific, technical, and societal? In our second panel, we're going to take a forward look at European policy and legislation in this area, and think a little about what an ideal EU framework would look like. The important point is that all of you watching and listening today are welcome to take part. So if you've got any questions, you can submit them through the Q&A function and do please comment and talk to each other on the chat function. But just a reminder, anything that you send in the all attendees part of the drop down menu of chat will be public to all. If we, you want to tweet, and we hope that you do, it's at Gashtime Forum and at CSL Bearing with the hashtag Transforming Tomorrow. We're going to start, and I'm very excited about this, with Bertalan Mesco, Director of the Medical Futurist Institute. But before I talk to him, I wanted to ask all of you through the Slido function, how optimistic are you that cell and gene therapies are on the cusp of realising their promise for patients? So let's have those questions up on Slido now and uh, just take a look at that and tell us what you think. So a big number saying yes. So that's a lot of enthusiasm. So let me now come to Bertalan. Bertalan, a lot of enthusiasm there. Do you think it's justified? Of we course. Have to have a, like we have to have an the day we deal with this issue. I'm sorry about that, Vivian. Thank you for the question. Um, I think it's justified. There is some optimism around how COVID-19 has impacted the whole industry, um, how this pandemic has led to a big boost about the attention and the PR of those technologies. But I'm also not so optimistic when I look at how fast regulations can change or keep up with the pace of innovations. And especially I'm not so optimistic when I look at how we people in healthcare can change and how fast we can adopt uh, innovations. And it's interesting because COVID has had a massive effect on all of this. Absolutely. Um, it's a devastating effect, but at the same time, I think we have to say it out loud that COVID-19 has led to a really quick technological adoption. Uh, patients and physicians worldwide had to start using telemedical services, uh, at-home laboratory tests, health sensors, smartwatches at home to be able to measure, obtain any kind of data that could support their medical decisions. So the techn technological adoption took place in the span of weeks, maybe uh, last spring, but that's just not enough. Um, with technological adoption always comes the cultural adoption that takes time. Um, I'm afraid there is a widening gap between the two now, but if you could put the cultural transformation next to the technological adoption we have seen already, I'm optimistic that we might save a, a decade's worth of progress in, in using these technologies. So what do you see as the new normal, uh, assuming that we ever get back to anything like normal? Well, let's, you know, we can remain hopeful that with vaccinations, we can do that quite soon. In some countries, the new, the new norm is already here. But to sum it up, I think the new norm is something like we futurists had been striving for even before the pandemic, a hybrid model that um, instead of meeting a physician with every minor health issue, let's use the potentials of telemedicine and remote care in general uh, to save time to save physicians from burning out after a few months, but giving them a chance to enjoy the benefits of meeting patients in person, you know, face to face. But when there is a health issue, we can also solve through remote care services. When then let's use those technologies. And the only thing that was in the way 
in that respect before the pandemic was the technological adoption. So the new norm is going to be something like uh, two thirds of medical visits taking place in person like before, but one th at least one third, if not more, will have to take place remotely. I, I, th I think that's all right. And it has been a luxury already to be able to meet a medical professional with every health, every minor health issue we might have. I mean, certainly you've seen um, older people adopt technology. You know, uh, people's grannies have taken to Zoom like ducks to water and they're, they're very happy with it now. But I wonder what kind of mindset can prepare us for using these kind of advanced technologies in healthcare. I mean, you've, you've suggested that we shouldn't expect to see a doctor all of the time. But what else can help us prepare for this kind of technological future? I think digital literacy is crucial, but we cannot expect patients, especially elderly patients, to adopt digital literacy in weeks or months. That's why we very much need the support of medical professionals who are trained to help these patients get better at digital literacy. So the real problem here is not whether we can teach patients how to use certain medical websites or health sensors or smartwatches, but whether we can fill this communication gap that has been around for decades between medical professionals and patients. The gap is about, there are many patients who would love to ask technological questions or, or where to find medical information online to their primary care physicians, but they have never been encouraged, if not discouraged, to ask these questions. On the other side, we have a lot of medical professionals today who are trained uh, in using such technologies so they could help their patients with um, analyzing health data, which medical website to choose or how to be active on social media in a respect, respectful and um, safe way, but they just don't have the time to, to launch, to begin such conversation with patients. So filling this communication gap would be crucial um, in the digital health era. But if I can mention one more thing about the mindset that you asked, it's the futurist mindset. I know it sounds far-fetched, but I think we all have to learn how to live a little bit in the future. By this, I mean that we, we have to actively, proactively think about um, all the ways we could interact with futuristic technologies. So, so this way, maybe, just maybe, we would have time to emotionally and culturally prepare. Because it's what's, what has been going on in healthcare in the 21st century is not a technological revolution. Saying, um, the medical futurist is saying that, so I should stay on the technological side. But no, that has been a cultural transformation. The way the doctor-patient hierarchy has been transforming into a equal level partnership simply matters so much more and has a much bigger impact on patients' lives and physicians' jobs than which microchip or head sensor we start using from next year. That's why the futurist mindset will be crucial for all of us. That's a very, very important point you make. And I, I, I know that you absolutely scour the world um, for the best digital health technologies, making lives better. So I can't resist asking you, Bertalan, for a couple of examples of the ones that you think are really making a difference at the moment. Well, those examples come to mind that have the most obvious impact on patients' lives. A good telemedical application can literally save lives. A health sensor or smartwatch that patients can wear um, by feeling comfortable with using the device could literally help save lives by measuring ECG, for example, and detecting um, medical conditions that might be in the background and that, that might not cause symptoms, but these will happen in the future. So what I'm trying to say here is that all the data that can be found in ourselves, in our bodies, in our physiology, could have been helpful even decades ago, but we simply didn't have the technologies for that, but now we do. And these health sensors, smartwatches, wearables, um, smartphone apps and telemedical services come to mind first. But if I can be a bit more futuristic than that and, and think about a few technologies that might not be in practice today, but could be not in decades from today, but in a few years. And I'm thinking about 3D printing um, medications in customized dosages um, using 3D bioprinters to print out tissues that can save lives by replacing uh, and, and supporting organ shortages. I'm thinking about artificial intelligence, artificial narrow intelligence algorithms that can help make the, the best medical decisions for patients by scanning through all the 30 million or even more than 30 million medical studies out there. 
Um, if I think about using artificial intelligence for finding new drug combinations, no pharma company could, could think of before, these blow my mind away. And these technologies make me feel like science fiction is becoming real. If just once for your life, you can see an ultrasound device that can use with a smartphone in action, I guarantee you that you will feel like science fiction has become real. So let's turn now to some of these advanced uh, cell and gene therapies. And I wanted to ask you before getting on to the specifics about what are the things that help get a medical innovation into practice quickly? Because, I mean, we've seen that COVID has accelerated enormously uh, progress of technologies into medicine. So, but what are, the, what are the practical steps that work? I know that I'm supposed to say that um, good regulations, clear policies, um, well-designed guidelines coming from medical associations and enough funding really facilitate this process. But in my experience, when the, when the approach, the mindset is there, when we have the people in the healthcare system who want to make things happen, then they will make things happen. The, the examples that come to my mind uh, about regions, not even countries, but regions in the world, where medical innovation have been taking place because we had the right people in leadership positions who wanted to bring this forward, who wanted to bring those innovative ideas, sometimes even not, not even technologies, but approaches like patient design, asking patients on the highest level of decision making in an organization. And sometimes um, in bringing these technologies into the action, it always depended on the right people in leadership positions. If we have them right now, then patients will start benefiting from these technologies. Because if we even have the right, the absolute best policies, guidelines, all these bureaucratic background or bubble around these innovations, I don't think that it can still break through the walls and reach patients if the mindset is not there. Now, I know that genomics is your background. And uh, presumably, you watch cell and gene therapies at advance. Um, what do you think is so exciting about them? Uh, and do you see them as being disruptive? Well, I feel like I have been lucky because since the age of six, I wanted to become a researcher, devoting my life to, to research in genomics. So I could witness the whole process, the evolution of genomics from the Human Genome Project to the really innovative uh, cell and gene therapies. And I think what, what's really unique about those is that they try to fix the issue the, at its core. I'm talking about genetic conditions and other medical conditions where with good medications, we have, of course, a spectrum of innovative medications in the world today, but we might be able to only alleviate pain or side effects with those medications. But CGT um, technologies go and try to reach the core of the problem. And that's really unique because it, well, first of all, it makes us feel like we are gods in this system and we can really alter the human genome uh, that might lead to eradicating genetic conditions forever. But we also have to acknowledge that playing God comes with really huge risks. And um, I assume th these risks have been around, uh, have, been, uh, have been impacting the scientific progress behind CGT. And that's what we have to be fine with because that's how scientific progress works. But of course, when gene therapies came in first in the late 90s, and there was a huge hype about them at the time, and as I mentioned in my introduction, they failed uh, and they were withdrawn and you know, we didn't hear anything about them for a decade or so. Why do you think that was? I mean, it, I mean obviously there were there was unacceptable side effects, but why do you think it happened like that? Uh, obviously, nothing can alleviate the pain that those families um, have been feeling since losing patients uh, during these therapies. But the, I'm afraid this is how scientific progress works. And the only thing I hear when I see those failed attempts is how rigorous the system is. Even if we have an amazingly innovative and exciting new technology, we have clinical trials to go through and we must, as a scientific and medical community, we must make sure that those treatments that will reach patients in the, the everyday practice of medicine will be safe and, uh, and effective. And, and I'm afraid that's why the first few treatments failed, but now we see amazing progress. Plus maybe the, as you mentioned that there was huge hype. Uh, I don't even remember seeing a bigger hype about any technologies or new treatments in medicine than uh, cell and gene therapies about more than a decade ago. 
and I guess um, CGT had a um, sort of a PR problem back then. People expected too much, why the technology couldn't deliver. And that again creates a communication gap that, that takes time to overcome. And maybe what has, what's different today is that due to the pandemic, uh, because of the mRNA-based vaccines, that a group of technologies behind CGTs has just received amazing PR and a lot of attention. So now, you know, everyday people who have never heard about mRNAs before, now they are discussing how effective these treatments can, can be. And I guess based on the knowledge that they gain along the road, it might lead to a better general understanding of the technologies used uh, in CGTs. So maybe policymakers can make better decisions. Maybe patients would have a clearer image and maybe physicians could have uh, better expectations about these treatments. So finally, I have to ask you, the medical futurist, where do you see the next frontiers of science and innovation taking us, particularly in the development and uptake of uh, cell and gene therapies? Absolutely. Uh, I get such questions. And when people ask me these questions, I feel like they sort of expect me to say uh, longevity and uh, nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. But I would just love to be able to download my medical records right now. I think this is the right first step. <laughs> so what I see the next 20 years, uh, it's in digital health. The notion that there are advanced technologies that provide data to both medical professionals and patients. Finally, involving the most underused resource in healthcare. I'm talking about patients here. And these technologies leading to making patients the point of care. I think this is simply the biggest milestone in the history of medicine that we can make patients the point of care. And maybe when we have patients as the newest members of the medical team taking active part, proactive part in their health and disease management, then maybe then we can start talking about really science vision like technologies and their role in the future of healthcare, artificial intelligence in decision-making, in drug repurposing or analyzing the data patients can measure uh, through their health devices. But only then when we could make this first very important step involving patients on the highest level of decision-making. Well, Bashan, I think that uh, around Europe, all the people who are listening to this, will, who are patients, will be cheering you on. Go medical futurist. <laughs> because you're saying something I think that they've been saying for a very long time. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We've so appreciated having you here. It's always a pleasure. The pleasure was mine. Thank you so much Thank for having you. me. Great. Well, so from one vision of the future, let's now uh, talk to our first panel. And this is really about the current status quo. And I'm delighted to introduce Dan Hart, who is honorary consultant hematologist at the Royal London Hospital in the UK, and Avril Daly, who's chief executive of the Retina International and Vice President of Eurodis, uh, which is the absolutely wonderful rare disease organization. Hello, both of you. How nice to have you here with us. Likewise, Vivian. Hi, Vivian. Nice to be here. So uh, let's ask first, I mean, Dan, you're involved in the treatment of uh, haemophilia patients. How do you view uh, advanced therapies? Because haemophilia is an area that already has lots of therapies. So can these cell and gene therapies really add any more to the treatment options that you have? I think this is a very fundamental question to how within my specialty of haematology and haemophilia care, how gene therapies might fit. But also within the landscape of gene therapies, is haemophilia representative of, of all uh, you know, monogenic disorders looking for a, a therapeutic cure in inverted commas? Um, and maybe to explain, I think haemophilia has got some excellent pre-existing therapies, um, but the transformative step to actually uh, inserting a, a, a gene that's able to produce the protein in that individual for the first time to take away the bleed risk uh, and maybe to, to totally normal levels of bleed risk to their peers, I think it, it is truly transformative for those individuals, releasing them from very frequent either intravenous or subcutaneous treatments of so-called prophylaxis to avoid those bleeding therapies, those bleeding complications. But I, I think there will be a spectrum of, of, um, of uptake from, from patients uh, as there will be with clinicians in healthcare. And I think listening to Bertrand thinking about IT and, and 
uh, uptake, you know, the, the, the center specific variables as well as patient and family specific variables of perception, that futurist mindset, uh, we, that will be a spectrum of uptake. And I think that's part of our challenge in the next decade. Let me go uh, to you, Avril, on that, because on the other hand, rare diseases, there are many rare diseases where there is simply no treatment available at all. And for rare diseases, um, like haemophilia, where there are treatments, these cell and gene therapies offer something extraordinary. Well, absolutely. And many patients will be following and tracking uh, the development of gene therapies from, you know, the research stage, from the very basic research stage right the way through. And, you know, we often talk about gene therapy as something in the future. You know, this is the future of healthcare. But of course, gene therapies are available now um, and they're having impact on patients' lives now. But unfortunately, as you say, they're, they're not available to all. And the widespread knowledge of these uh, cell and gene therapies, you know, there are a lot of research and clinical trials going on, Dan, which, but presumably a lot of those have been halted or have had difficulties while the COVID uh, pandemic has been going on. So, so there's certainly been um, challenges because of COVID, but I suppose in contrast to the majority of other interventional medicinal product trials, once gene therapy is in, there's no going back. And that's part of the, the kind of the counselling step that it, it's, it's unlike any other therapeutic I've used before, where is an, there's an irreversible step. You can't take it out again. Mm -hmm. And consequently, it doesn't stop for COVID either. So we've had to work around uh, the, the COVID restrictions, uh, People have maybe moved geographically at times and been stuck. Uh, and so the regulators and, and the, the partners in the trials have worked very hard to, to recognise the, the, the risks and threats that patients have perceived during COVID, whilst also maintaining the integrity of the data to make sure that these trials deliver complete data sets uh, and, and able to then uh, answer the questions that the trials have set out. And the more we hear, Avril, about these cell and gene therapies, the more excited that patients with no treatments uh, become. And I wonder if the hype is as great as it was in the 90s, or is it tempered with much more realism now? I think it's very different. And one of the reasons for that is because uh, of the access to information that patients have right now. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's very important to mention that there is a diversity in access to that information because not everybody does have broadband uh, to the level that others do. Not everybody is, has that digital literacy that we've just heard discussed, uh, discussed, you know, so there is that issue. However, there's more understanding, there's more, there's more of a community. So there's more sharing of information, of data, of understanding of what's happening, and not just in one condition, but from condition to condition. So if you look at the rare disease community in its entirety, particularly, you've got 6,000 different uh, diseases there but you will have collaboration and, and on the issues, the fundamental issues that affect everybody when it comes to the, the, the infrastructure involved in, in the development of therapy. So that research infrastructure leading to clinical trials, leading to you know, the registers, to, to, to the, the issues concerning access to medicine are, are common to a lot of these, this community. So they're very aware and clued in to this reality um, and support each other in how to develop systems in their disease area that can help with the, the, the development of research and the ultimate access to the therapy. So it's, it's a different consideration. There is hope, but what I would say to you, Vivian, is often when we discuss access to medicines, you know, we talk about it in the context of value and we talk about it in the context of, of cost and the challenges there, but the fundamental issue often with, with patients is that they can't get access to the basic diagnosis in the first place. You know, and this is a huge roadblock because if you don't have access to a diagnosis, you know, and you're waiting in some cases up to 20 years for an actual appropriate diagnosis, then, you know, you're missing the opportunity to not only contribute to the research and that data stream and being involved in a clinical, tr clinical trial, et cetera, but, you know, you could be too late for you to get access to a therapy. And we see that a lot um, in the context, certainly in the, in the clinical trial phase um, with, with, with siblings, maybe with one child who has unfortunately been diagnosed far too late to get access to a therapy and it's the second child that will get access to that therapy but maybe a little too late uh, as well but you know these are the challenges so I think when we're when we're thinking about access and all of these issues along the the the, the life cycle of the therapeutic development we have to consider all of the little the, the periods along you know and and 
what do we have? What, what uh, policies do we need to make each stronger to enable better access ultimately and so that patients can turn hope into reality? So uh, Dan, really strong uh, feeling there that, uh, uh, that access is not simply about the cost of the treatment or its availability, but the whole chain. But uh, thinking about the availability, that is, uh, uh, and let's not come to the cost yet, but the availability is another issue because some of these uh, salon gene therapies are highly specialized, which means that patients are really going to have to travel. Now I know from having talked to lots of people in rare disease community that actually travel is not an issue for something like this, but even so there is an issue in which hospitals are going to make such technologies available and which are going to be effectively chosen to offer them. And interesting listening to Bertrand's view about the patient centricity of his futurist view of the next 10 years of, of a true partnership between patients and, and their healthcare. And actually, arguably, gene therapy will, in the haemophilia space, may need to embrace exactly that model, because actually the infusion of the gene therapy isn't that complicated. It's a, it's a simple day case intravenous transfusion in a peripheral vein is actually the clock starts there where they leave. There's short-term security about, you know, the infusional complications are very, very rare and, and those that have been reported very minor. Is the subsequent follow-up, which is fairly mundane, actually, it's, it's peripheral blood tests and just monitoring uh, various parameters, particularly liver enzymes, to, to, to look at potential um, inflammatory components of receiving the gene therapy. So, you know, the, the travel for the infusion may be simple, as you point out, but then how we organize ourselves as specialists to ensure that the right person is seeing results in a timely manner to intervene crucially, maybe with some immunomodulation at the right time. And even, you know, a result appearing on a Friday afternoon, not being seen until a Monday, may be too late. You know, that it all needs to be micromanaged to, 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 to quite a, a, a sensitive detail of time in, in those early weeks. Um, and then there's the subsequent longevity of the, the, the product once it's in, and, and the liver health downstream, and there's different questions there. Um, so how we amalgamate a, 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 an individual and family going through a gene therapy pathway with the multiple carers that may be involved in different centers and actually make it a, a cohesive journey with the safety net at every step, I think is part of our challenge. And um, the follow-up is absolutely critical, isn't it, Avril? Because uh, one of the things that is going to be key in all these therapies is the durability of response. In other words, is this a, is this a, a one-off that will be a cure? You know, will the response diminish over time? And you have to do follow-up and you have to do uh, registries for all these things. And are we in a position to do that? I mean, what I'm hearing from Dan is, is actually we're not. Well, so I, I, oh, so, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, have I misrepresented you there? Yeah, no, well, so just to, so I, I, I think I think we are very close to that. I mean, I, I think although we haven't actually got the gene therapy models mapped out in, in detail, I think the there's been a tremendous focus on the, these issues and, and the issues about long term registries. What now, well ahead of actually needing them, they're, they're being mapped out, and the, the the politics of who drives and leads and who follows. Um, that the commissioning, I mean, just with the, the type one um, uh, spinal muscular atrophy dosing in the UK National Health Service of a, a, of a five month old boy and, and the subsequent commissioning of four centers uh, in the pediatric setting for that kind of gene therapy, now that it's come off, off trial, you know, starts to really wake us all up to, it's really just next year or the year after that we have to have these plans in place. Um, so so I, th I think we're, we're getting our ducks in a row as we would say in, in, in the UK. But it's much more difficult, though, in across Europe and for rare disease, because if you only have one or two patients in each country, inevitably they have to travel. And are there is the follow up in their home countries going to be as effective? Well, um, I think it's fair to say that patients appreciate that, you know, no one country is going to be able to to provide everything that's needed when it comes to 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 not only the delivery of the treatment, but as you say, the follow up. One area where we have potential here and real hope as a patient community is the European reference networks. So they've been recently established in Europe and they're made up of 24 specific networks that are coordinated to provide, you know, a home for all rare diseases essentially, 
And so the coordinating hub is based in, in a healthcare provider at, 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 in a European country and centers of expertise uh, feed into that in sort of a hub and spoke model. Um, so there is the opportunity through the development of the ERNs to provide that, that follow-up, so the, the delivery of, of, of care and, and, and access so that the expertise travels, if you like, not the, the patient necessarily. But I think what's important here, critically important is the development of registers and the ERNs are looking to that. So, you know, we know that the sharing of data must be optimized now across the various different infrastructures. And, and I think there we have, we have a challenge. You know, we have to look at, you know, common, how, how do we deal with, with, uh, with that reality of exchange of information and data across different platforms. This is something that is being developed through um, you know, the, this, this findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable um, data approaches across Europe, but they must be positioned, you know, at a central point. And really the European reference networks are perfectly positioned to deal with that and have the opportunity to not only share data in the context of diagnosis and care, but also have the opportunity to really develop into providing data on, 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 on you know, the, the, the surveillance of the patient post delivery of therapy. There really is an opportunity here. And you know, European reference networks were designed as this one-stop shop, if you like, for all issues concerning rare diseases. But you know, I think it has to be stated that these are these are young. You know, uh, I think 2017, March 2017, we had our very first meeting, kickoff meeting, and now are being reviewed after five years. They need support, but they have huge potential. And um, one of our audience members, C. Smith, said, uh, why should patients also travel? There are also physicians and nurses who could travel for follow up. <laughs> it, it, is, it, it is extraordinary. We are always making patients travel. But yes. uh, and I wanted to ask Dan, talking about hub and spoke. Now, my uh, knowledge of medicine is that all uh, hospitals want to be the hubs, not the spokes. <laughs> and that's that's a difficulty that's going to have to be sorted out, isn't it? So I think these d discussions um, at, at regional levels, at national levels, and even international levels across the continent um, will become an issue. I, I mean, with colleagues, uh, speaking with colleagues recently um, in, in Holland, for example, where the six major teaching hospitals hosting haemophilia care, as you say, all, all want to be hubs, none of them want to be spokes. Mm -hmm. I, I think, as Avril's pointed out, I mean, I mean th there's even within haemophilia, there will be a number of different platforms. Haemophilia, we, we can't generalize even in the same disease. Uh, so haemophilia B is different from haemophilia A in terms of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the durability of, of expression, um, the, the, the peaks of expression, um, and then the, the Im immune suppression used after infusions is different between platforms. So I think it is the case that those who have been involved in clinical trials will bring an expertise to the table that will need to be uh, applied initially and then shared and, and, and bring others through to really become familiar with these therapies. And I, I'm sure commissioners will want the security of those that have been doing this for four or five years through clinical trials to be at least, uh, you know, it, it significantly involved in those early um, post-trial deliveries of gene therapy. But you're right that the, the local politics um, will need to be pr pragmatically worked through and there will be different solutions in different parts of, of the continent. And actually, I suppose, Avril, we need to think about each one of these therapies. I mean, we tend to throw them all in one bucket together, but actually they're, they're very different in terms of, you know, the kind of procedures that you need, the kind of expertise, the kind of follow up and I guess we need a, a, a proper framework to think about those things on a bespoke basis, one by one, rather than all lumped together. Yes, and I think that's very important. And I think Dan brings up a very good point um, as well earlier in, in the discussion. Um, a lot of the, the actual delivery of these therapies is, 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 is quite straightforward, you know, and it's important to understand that there, there will be a lot of expertise garnered through the actual uh, clinical trial phase, you know, it's, it's important uh, to know that, you know, it's, the, the therapies are there, but, you know, realistically, realistically, we could almost, if, if, if when you, particularly in the context of ERNs and patients are involved in that process, you know, through their European patient advocacy groups and action groups within these, these, um, these different uh, uh, networks in order to be able to bring the perspective of the patient on issues such as this. 
And it's very important to note that patients know where the centers of expertise are. You know, we know where they are, you know, and, and per disease area, if you live in Germany, you know, you might say, well, well, my disease, my center of expertise is in the Netherlands. That's known, it's understood. But I think, you know, to it's it's really important for the for the for the clinical framework to be established. You know, that's that's really, really critical. And the models are there, you know, and the reality is, you know, as, as C. Smith said, he's he's quite right, you know, the patients shouldn't always have to travel, but you know, the expertise and follow-up can. And that's that's the important piece, really. Really ultimately, Vivian, patients want to get access to therapies fast. And, and therapies are on the market now. They're not available to all, but to those that they are available, we know where to go. And there's time is of the essence here. And things, you know, developments around these issues take a long time, but, you know, we can't be in a situation where a therapy exists and is available to a patient that could be life, life enhancing or life changing or, you know, life giving to a patient, giving, giving them more years of life than they thought they would have. You know, we, we have to act now. I think that's the important thing. So obviously affordability is going to be a major issue, but as I've said earlier, we're going to have to think about a completely different uh, reimbursement uh, model because we're talking about very large upfront costs. We don't yet know yet whether, frankly, it's going to work or not. I mean, if it was a car and it didn't work, you'd be able to get your money back. <laughs> But, you know, what do you do with a, with, a, with a gene therapy? And there are all sorts of other ethical concerns about payment as well, and not just for payers, but also for patients. So, you know, should you as a patient, if you're on a first generation therapy that doesn't work very well, have access to later ones, even though you've already, you know, had some of the pot available for that disease? Uh, what do you think about that, Dan? When to, to to jump into gene therapy as an individual uh, patient or a fa family considering for, for one of their for one of their family members, it, I think it's it's a really tough choice uh, in haemophilia for sure. I mean, perhaps with with uh, some of the diseases Avril represents, where you know the, the speed is of the essence as she articulates because of particular individuals only have a limited window in which they could be treated to to halt a, a progressive disease. But with haemophilia, I think the knowledge of we've got kind of viral based uh, vectors at the moment, there will be some non viral based um, uh, technologies coming coming through, even within the viral based uh, technologies that there's different ways to do that. Um, variability of outcome is one of the key unsolved problems that we have with gene therapy at the moment in haemophilia. Um, being able to look someone in the eye and say, some people having this therapy may get normal levels but some don't and some will get really quite low expression. So that variability and then the durability, you know, in three years time or five years time is all part of, of the uncertainty that we need to better understand. But as you rightly say, feed into the payment model and the commissioners will need to have reassurance uh, that they've got a, a meaningful expression to avert the need for reversion to the previous treatment. I think some of the guys that we've looked after at the Royal London going through gene therapy who maybe have had normal levels uh, at one stage of their gene therapy and now drifted to having mild haemophilia again are still very free of spontaneous bleeds. They are not requiring regular treatment. They're not incurring that regular treatment cost. So actually, although some might perceive that as a disappointment, that they've lost some of the efficacy of the treatment, the pragmatic solution is they're still in a very strong position, actually still surpassed the, the, the trial outcome expectation. Um, it, it's, it's actually the trial, trials have almost overperformed um, and, and way beyond our uh, original expectations where we wondered, could, could we get maybe 5% um, expression where great, greater than 1% was, was essentially the target. And now we're looking at heading north of 30%, north of 50%, um, you know, and, and that's becoming achievable. So it's almost the trials have been, uh, they've overperformed, raised our expectations, and we need to manage our own uh, expectation for the therapies as well as the commissioner's expectations. Um, but, you know, that's, it, it, we're still early days. I mean, the, the, this is still version 1.0, really, of, of efficacious gene therapy, and we will work through those iterations. And that's the big is ethical issue, isn't it, Avril? This thought that this is, as, as Dan put it so well, this is, you know, advanced therapies, uh, you know, 1.0. And a lot of people are 
really being pioneers for the future and they may not get that much benefit themselves. You know, this is something that is understood and a lot of patients will say, well, if I take this therapy, is it possible to have a therapy in the future? And that's disease specific, you know, and it's, it, there, there's, there's specificities about all of that. Um, but, you know, it must be understood as well that in many conditions, what may be seen as a, as a mild improvement or a small improvement has a huge impact on a person's quality of life. And that must be understood. The biggest issue for our patient community right now, and a lot of patient representatives, particularly in the rare disease space, will tell you this, when there is no other therapeutic um, intervention and there is no other hope, or certain therapies have, have been used to the point where the patient has become immune to their benefits, you know, this is, this is an option, it is a choice, but we are very early on. We are seeing therapies that have a curative impact. Um, you know, we're seeing patients who have had access to therapies that have had that life-changing experience in a short period, you know, and to see a patient with that experience and see another patient who's living in the country next door, so to speak, not have access to that is a really hard thing, you know, and there's an ethic, there's an ethical uh, implication there that we all should be aware of. And it is a challenge, you know, we're, we're at the beginning. And I think we all appreciate as well that similar to, you know, the IT situation that we're, we're all faced with as well as, as a global community, you know, so, uh, regulation is not catching up with science and, and it's a challenging space. There is absolutely you no know, question how we measure improvement needs to change. And, 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 and as Bartran said, the really interesting thing to, to listen to the patients and to understand what is of value to them will help us all ultimately. But fundamentally, as a European, you know, I think what's, what's a real challenge for us in this community is the fact that we all have great expertise in assessing therapies. Um, and, you know, it's, it's too, uh, once, once we get past that regulatory space and we get into a health technology uh, assessment process, it's, it's so variable that it really is leaving people behind. And so a much more a Eurocentric approach to the assessment of these therapies that hopefully will not only get them to the patients that need them faster, but improve the, the whole perception of innovation at a European level is, is something that we all need to work towards. And how far, I mean, I'm interested in both your comments on this, how far should patients be the arbiters of how much risk they should take in having a particular uh, therapy because that's a, a I mean a regulation takes account of, of of risk but sometimes patients are prepared to take more risk than they're allowed to where should that dial be um, for these kind of therapies for patients Avril? I think it's important in the context of rare diseases to also understand that there is a very unique often and very special relationship between the, par the patient, the parent and the clinical uh, lead um, that, that they're dealing with, that, you know, their, their clinician is very important. And, you know, I've seen in my experience in the rare disease space that conversation happen. And sometimes difficult conversations happen where, you know, there is that level of understanding and communication about risk. Um, and so, so, so it's, it's, it does, it, you know, there, there needs to be an understanding of that relationship and that, yes, of course, you know, oftentimes what we see in fact, anecdotally, and this is an anecdote is that older patients, maybe adult patients are, 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 are more, you know, willing to take the risk and parents sometimes, you know, will understand, but it depends. Uh, but that relationship is very important. The patient, you know, the parent is not going to put their child through something that is going to be burdensome they're going to read the data, they're going to understand in many cases. And we're seeing a lot of that. So I think that needs to be, to be taken into account as well. Um, but, you know, one, you know, when we look at regulation, you know, right, what do the regulations do? They look at, you know, safety, 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 and safety, you know? So really once that is, once that we passed that post, if you like, it becomes really the relationship between the, the, the patient and their, their clinician is, is critical in, in those decisions and that decision-making process. I want to close this first panel by asking you both, and, uh, and D uh, Dan, uh, let's turn to you first on this. If you could tell the audience just one thing about your perspective of the future of cell and gene therapies, and you just had a tweet space to do it, what would, what would that be? Gosh. Um... Avril, I'm going to come to you in a moment. Yes. Um, well, so, so tr transforming healthcare tomorrow, 
um, I think it really is not far from tomorrow. Um, and, and I think these transformative therapies will be coming to clinics uh, across Europe um, in, in the next months, next years. The trials are open, uh, early phase and, and, and later phase. Uh, and, and Avril and her organization and the haemophilia uh, and leverage to see uh, Smith on, on, the, on the line from the haemophilia community who will know well uh, that, that these trials are available for early adopters to, 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 who want to be pioneers. But those that are, are wanting to watch and wait, that they are coming to, to be delivered in healthcare systems. And it's up to us to map out that equitable access, as, as Avril's uh, alluded to. But transforming healthcare tomorrow, um, really tomorrow, is, is not so far away. Thank you so much, Avril. Yes, and, and I would agree. Uh, I, I think, and, and as I said before, you know, we often talk about gene and cell therapies as being in the future when they are in the now. Unfortunately, our infrastructures from a healthcare provision perspective are not what they could be to ensure that, you know, that this whole area of innovation is developed as fast as it possibly could be. So really we need to understand um, that access to these therapies depends on our healthcare system and should be, there should be a knowledge of the importance of genetics and genomics in the delivery of healthcare. That is a priority area. It's not niche, it's not the future. It's not just a small portion of the community. We're learning so much more about genetics right now. I'm talking about rare diseases. You know, we're, there, are many, there, are, there are many conditions that we would consider common that have been broken down to their genetic basis. You know, so we, we need to understand that. And governments do need to, to not only support the, the delivery of healthcare and, and, and the infrastructure development, work together on that, but you know, also, and I think it's important that they support the health technology assessment processes as well. You know, and the fact that this is, that innovation is coming hard and fast and we need to have the appropriate, the supported infrastructures to really deal with what's happening now. Thank um, you so much. Dan Hart, Avril Daly, it's been such a pleasure talking to you both and you'll be delighted to know that I've just this very morning been talking about a global approach to wider knowledge on genomics uh, using the creative industries. So I may be able to fulfil your wish right there, Avril. So thank you so much and let's now turn to our second panel. So, uh, as you can see, we've got a very splendid uh, panel. We have uh, Christian Silva Bouchoy, who's the member of the uh, European Parliament from Romania and chair on industry uh, research and energy. Uh, we have uh, Paige Bischoff, who's senior vice president of global public affairs of the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine. Uh, we have Diane Kleinemans, who's president of the Commission of Drugs Reimbursement of the Belgian National Institute for Health and Disability Insurance. And finally, last but absolutely not least, we have Elona Rachel, who's Quality Assessor of Biologics in the Austrian Medicines and Medical Devices Agency, although I should tell you that she is speaking in a personal capacity, not for the agency. So uh, let's turn to you all and uh, talk a bit about the kind of frameworks that we need uh, for the future. Um, Ilona, would you like to start us off? What do we need uh, for the future? I think, first of all, we need a very clear policy. Uh, with what is the direction that we want to go? And then we need that policy reflected in legislation. Um, I'm at the interface of legislation and science as an assessor. And my experience is that we always have trouble when there is a misalignment um, in this respect. And we have European legislation, but we also still have national legislation. And at the interface, we do have disharmonization on occasion. Diane, how about you? Um, I, I think what is very important, it's uh, in frame, it's to be very creative for the future and creative at all level, uh, not only in research and development, but also at the level of the authority to be sure that we can quickly answer to the need, uh, which uh, are the consequence of uh, the new health technology. I think this is fundamental and uh, we have to think out of the box to be able to face that. Andres, how about you? 
You know, I, I think the, uh, the, the first, uh, the building on Ilona Stajana's points, I, I think that the first, we, we need to continue to, to think about the robust scientific assessment. It, it's, it's a base, you know, we, we, we cannot deviate from this, from this principle. Second, I think we have to think about legislation, which is uh, somehow adoptable uh, and, and develops, you know, according to also uh, other developments. I give example, you know, currently development of, of around artificial intelligence, access to data, the way we, we are getting them. We heard this already today, uh, but also, you know, new, uh, new other products like medical devices, they also can be, can be on crossroad. The, ter the third point I'd like to raise, of course, is something which is often is coming in the discussion, is reduction of administrative burden. I think we should find a way to do this, you know, where is possible, but of course, again, not on the cause of quality, safety, and efficacy and the assessment uh, process. So, so I think this is my, my third point. The fourth point I think is other important one is about the, uh, the way we should work with academia and nonprofit developers. We we see this; they they really need more guidelines. They need you know help from regulators to to help with development. They are lost sometimes. They really need to have the phone number or the place to go and get this advice. And finally, the last point already mentioned by, by, by Diana, I think it's about the cooperation between, I'm sorry, by, by Avril earlier in the panel about the cooperation between different bodies, you know, regulatory agencies in the medicine field, medical devices area, but also with uh, HTA bodies and pricing reinvestment as well. Christian, from a political point of view, uh, and from that perspective, what should an EU framework for the future um, have for, uh, for these advanced cell and gene therapies? Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I, I would like to, to, to answer to this from, uh, from the two perspectives uh, that uh, I can bring to, to this debate. Uh, first, from uh, the perspective as chair of Industry Research and Energy Committee, and here, uh, I believe that the political signal to support even more research in the future is very clear from uh, European institution, from European Parliament. We have uh, a Horizon Europe as a program which offer many opportunities. I hope also for, uh, for uh, uh, the advanced therapies uh, that we need so much. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemics also showed us clearly that uh, we have to invest more in uh, research in uh, uh, what would be the advanced therapies and uh, be better prepared for, uh, for future situations and not uh, after that uh, try to find solutions as we needed to do with the vaccines because uh, uh, what we developed, what was developed as vaccine, of course, is based on, uh, on uh, innovation and on uh, uh, advanced uh, uh, therapy mechanisms. And of course, uh, from the perspective of you for health program that I'm the rapporteur on behalf of European Parliament, I believe that uh, we should uh, use this opportunity when we want to do, to make our health systems more resilient, also to talk more about uh, the issue that, are we, debate, that are, we are debating today. Because it's clearly that uh, uh, without uh, uh, cell uh, therapies, without cell gene therapies, Without uh, these advanced uh, therapies, ATMPs, it would be very difficult to fight uh, uh, very effectively and efficiently against uh, the uh, challenges that we have today, and especially cancer, but not only cancer, many other diseases cannot be beaten without uh, going in this direction. And for this, of course, it's important, the political signal, the funding for research and also for uh, developing and also it will be important to speak with the member states because many of the decisions when we accommodate a, a drug, a new therapy uh, in uh, uh, the reimbursed list of some member states, it's a decision of the member state. And here they should understand and we should act in the same direction, all 27 countries. Paige, what about you? How do you see, you know, what are the, what are the key elements of a future European framework? So I'm I think hearing, building on yeah I'm hearing from lots of people that more investment in the regulatory uh, underpinnings you know more people uh, is is absolutely one of them. 
I think that's absolutely true. And so building on some what the other panelists have said, and, and particularly just MEP Bashoy, you know, the pharma strategy right now, European pharma strategy referred to cell and gene therapies as major milestones of innovation. So there's really this recognition about the important role that these therapies have to play. But if we don't have the framework, as you point out, that supports it, then that's going to be a problem. Uh, one of the key areas that we look at is, of course, greater harmonization um, across Europe, which is critically important. And then, let me just throw out one area that clearly needs a lot of attention, and that would be GMO requirements, for example. So GMO legislation was put into place to protect crops and agriculture. And unfortunately, cell and gene therapies, particularly gene therapies, have been caught up in this legislation. During COVID, we did see the commission relax those requirements for developers of vaccines. And it would be fantastic and we'd love to see and are advocating for a permanent relaxation of those GMO requirements for all cell and gene uh, therapy clinical trials as well. So that's just one area, but there are many. I mean, Boshoy, is that on your, your to-do list? Until now, we, we didn't enter in, in, uh, in these details in the ENVI or ITRE committee. Of course, uh, when we we'll debate the pharmaceutical strategy and the industrial strategy of European Union, where, where pharma should play an important role, you know that one of the main pillars here, it will be to, to, to boost innovation and the, the therapies of the future. And of course, uh, what was presented earlier uh, could play a significant role. But I can, I should confess that until now we would, didn't discuss in depth these uh, issues, but it is important to, to start discussing. Let me turn now to quality and safety and of, of cell and gene therapies, but throughout Europe. And I want to come to you, Ilona, um, to have some of your insight from Austria's experience in the field. You know, how do we take Europe to the next level? As one of the comments we've been referring to cell and gene therapies, I do prefer the term ATMP, advanced therapy medicinal product, because we are dealing with medicinal products that require the medicines framework for the demonstration of safety and efficacy. I think that is crucial. Uh, and I see a trivialization ongoing at the moment in Europe. And for the life of me, I won't understand why the most complex medicinal products have been put in the oversight of the tissues and cells unit in the Europe European Commission, for example. And also we see that everybody is entitled, feels entitled to make their own therapies these days. And I think there is a big risk in that. I do believe in regulation. I do believe in the need for clinical trials for product specific data because you can't generalize from one ATMP to the next. And we need that framework for not only conducting the trials prior to license, but we also need the framework for generating long-term follow-up data after the trials and after licensure. And I think that is absolutely essential. And that's a key point, isn't it? Because actually you need to have these safety regulations in place, but they need to apply throughout and what you have at the moment is you have some hospitals effectively having a cottage industry where they make their own because it's uh, cheaper and there's a you know there's a there's a payment and access uh, issue and that is becoming a bit of a a, a problem um diane um what's your view on this um how do you how do you keep safety uh paramount across all these therapies, which are, as Ilona has said, very different. Uh, I fully agree with uh, what uh, Ilona has just said. Uh, it is a big concern and certainly uh, with, the sort of, with these new technology coming and the population being aware uh, about these new technology, uh, there is a, a huge lobbying to get access uh, as, uh, as early as possible and even too early when you look at uh, uh, the marketing authorization it come early and early with a, a huge level of uncertainty uh, which means that uh, uh, at the level of the payer and at the HTA assessment uh, we have to take decision based on uh, data which are fully <laughs> not fully complete and with a lot of uncertainty. So what we try to do is first 
with regard to reimbursement to have a, a managed entry agreement, uh, but also set in place a follow-up tool to continue to collect data uh, and be sure that uh, there is no signal coming that uh, there are safety issue or efficacy issue. This is a huge problem, which is becoming greater and greater uh, and which need to be addressed. Uh, one of the way we think is uh, an obvious way and a way we need to go, it's uh, international collaboration. You cannot do that. Uh, uh, solely at the national level, certainly for a rare disease um, where you have sometimes just a few patients in your in your your own country. Uh, so it's just by the collaboration of different countries that we can achieve something. As you know, uh, or I guess you know, we have the Benelux initiative, which is one uh, platform where uh, at present five countries are collaborating. Austria is one of them, but also. Belgium, the Netherlands, Luxembourg, and Ireland. Uh, and we, tr we work together um, to follow up the whole life of the drug, but also to make uh, together HTA assessment, uh, a rising scanning to uh, identify early enough what sort of uh, new technology are coming and what are the challenge associated with it. And in particular, with regard to safety, not only efficacy, but also safety, to put in place early enough the right tool to can follow up it up. Uh, I, I just give two examples. Uh, in the framework of the Beneluxa, we have set in place uh, some registries, one for um, one for um, associated with some neurological disease, uh, which help us to gather uh, more quickly important. Uh, information with regard to the safety and the efficacy of, of these uh, new technology. And I think that's the way to, to go forward, definitely. And Andres, this is a central dilemma of these um, advanced uh, therapies, which is that you go in for a regulatory approval with incomplete data because you can't have complete yep, data for because sure. you don't know how long this is going to last. So Andres, how are you going to do this in the, in the future? And what, you know, uh, your thoughts on upcoming initiatives on quality and uh, safety? Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, uh, as I think already was said. Uh, the pharma strategy is uh, is a is a big 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 work ahead of us. You know, we we, we plan to propose uh, solutions to number of areas in in end of 2022. But work is going on, and I I and, and this issue, of course, is one of those we have to address. I mean, I, uh, coming back to the questions of. Uh, Hospital exceptions, and this is how this apply across Europe. We know that this this is this is applied differently. We don't, we had this uh, serious long discussion in the pharma committee how to how to can get you know to the to the norms and that can be accepted across Europe. But I think this this will this this work have to be continued. And, and as a part of, of our uh, review, uh, we should re review of course experience with number of measures. You know, uh, we 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 allowed you know in the in the in in, in, in across the, the the pharma regulations, including of course uh, advanced therapies. So this is one one important area. The second, of course, it's uh, is linked to the GMO questions. Uh, I, we, we of course we are aware of the of the problem. In the action plan, you know, we, we propose after 10 years of assessment of advanced therapies, we, we, we started to work, you know, uh, link uh, GMO authorities with uh, medicines authorities to allow better, better, let's say, language and way to assess the, the situation because we are operating in the current regulatory framework. But also, we said in the pharma strategy, we are ready to, to, to see the, the, this in the, in, the, in the context of pharma, pharma regulations and I hope the experience with the uh, uh, GMO uh, you know, adoption let's say uh, of the of the measures for, for, for COVID vaccines showed that it was not bad decision it's held with the with acceleration the procedure uh, with held with the clinical trials across Europe and I think it looks like you know we as a college of European Parliament and and uh, and, and, and developers and finally patients and citizens, we are all happy what, what, what we achieved. So, so let's have a look. 
And maybe the last point also, we showed that, that the, there is some kind of questions about the flexibility of the, of the regulations. And I think COVID showed that, that there is a room for some flexibility. And, but again, uh, and I will make this very strong, you know, um, whatever will be the, the final outcome, I think our role as a commission is to make sure that we cannot compromise, you know, uh, against the quality, safety, and efficacy, and I think this is the question, of course, you know how to how to reach this goal. So, uh, Paige, I'm seeing a future in which uh, payers and developers really have to work much, much more closely together. And there's this big question: is how robust does data have to be? How robust is robust enough when you know you're looking into a future which at the moment you haven't got any data for? So clinical trials, especially for the small patient populations for rare and ultra rare diseases, as was mentioned earlier, th this is clearly an issue. And that's why we think really that real world evidence becomes increasingly important when you're talking about ATMPs. Um, we're very encouraged by what the commission's doing right now in terms of the health data space. And it's really looking into an initiative uh, that will reduce fragmentation across the member states and also will standardize data across borders. So this is really a, a step in the right direction. And we think that those um, areas combined with, again, increased use of the real world evidence is going to help support this longer term data that we do need to acquire. And uh, I mean, people are sure, can uh, Horizon Europe um, help in this? In, and contribute to improvements in quality and safety? Of course, uh, uh, besides uh, what we have already in place, and of course, uh, there are already important advancements uh, in, uh, in this. I know that uh, uh, European Medicine Agency is expected to decide whether to approve five cell, cell and gene therapies this year. Uh, and uh, the projection is that uh, it will review or approve 10 to 20 cell and gene therapies each year by 2025. In the several years, the agency has approved three CAR T cell therapies to treat leukemia and lymphomas. So we already have these treatments, but of course uh, the future uh, the, the future is for uh, to discover even more. We are at the beginning, I believe, on, of these uh, uh, ATMPs with uh, these advanced therapies um, by the time and when uh, also uh, the right incentives will be for the pharma industry, for the researchers, uh, the discoveries will continue. Uh, Horizon Europe uh, has an important pillar, which is the health pillar. There you know that uh, the priority is cancer, uh, the fight against cancer. It is a mission for cancer, which was already decided uh, by political decision with the support of European Parliament, of the member states, but it will not be the only mission. It will be maybe the most important. We have, uh, I believe, around 7 billion euros, at least for uh, research in the health area. And of course, uh, part of this should be devoted to, uh, to these advanced uh, therapies. Uh, it is important to, to be in a constant dialogue with the uh, um, uh, European Commission, with Commissioner Gabriel, with Director General Paquet, with the whole team there in order to see exactly and them to receive the right, uh, the right uh, informations for uh, preparing the calls for projects. Uh, most of uh, these uh, discoveries and these treatments, of course, will come uh, via private investment if we have the right incentives uh, and those companies which are investing will uh, uh, be assured that their investment will be, uh, will be of course, uh, uh, will will uh, will uh, will be taken into account and they will uh, uh, receive uh, back uh, the effort but uh, uh, not only to discover a treatment uh, itself but also also part of the treatment or just some uh, 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 important aspect of this could be financed via horizon europe so I, I want to discuss uh, price and affordability, which I know is the, is the big one, the elephant in the room. But Ilona, I just want to ask you a quick question. Uh, uh, answer briefly, if you would, is how do you go about assessing a long-term 
impact of therapy. So especially you if you've got kind of two tiers going on, a, a kind of, and I forgive me those who are working in university hospitals, um, where you've got a kind of garage operation and you've got a farmer operation. Well, for the farmer operations, it's clear the the tendency and what Emma has been requiring after market organizations is the registry setup, which is in, in itself still has some. Uh, difficulties, I would say. But the problem with the kind of local operations is that uh, you know, cost arises from the need to generate data, but also from the organizational setup. Having a dedicated person for pharmacovigilance, having dedicated per people for quality management, all that fills into cost. And um, I don't have personal experience from Austria in terms of uh, sort of local uh, manufacturers, but what is clear is that the hospital exemption framework is completely heterogeneous across Europe, and there are some highly regulated hospital exemption frameworks, I believe France is one of them, and I think Spain as well, and then there are others where um, the requirements are on the other end of the scale, so it's difficult to generalize. So I'm hearing standardization is actually important. Let's get on to price and affordability. And uh, Paige, we're above all talking about innovative payment models. What kind of things might we be looking at? So I think there's great news. Developers of ATMPs are increasingly willing to put some of you know, their own um, uh, profitability at risk. And so they're really willing to work with developers um, on coming up with innovative payment models. So some of these look like outcomes-based. We're only going to be paid if the patient does indeed meet certain clinical milestones. So outcomes-based is, again, something that works obviously for the patient, for uh, the developer as well, because they're putting their actual skin into the game. There's payment over time. So if the therapy is you know, 600,000 euro, uh, maybe we pay, um, you know, uh, 200,000 euro per year over three years. Then you can combine the two things where you're not paying anything if, again, the patient's not meeting the clinical milestones. And this is very, very different from traditional pharmaceuticals. Traditional pharmaceuticals, we continue to pay over time, really whether a therapy works or not. You get your pills, you get your injection, you get your surgery. So we tend to pay for sick care. And what we're really suggesting is let's transform this and pay for true health care, where many of these can be transformative, durable, and potentially even curative. Um, there's also a subscription model. So for those of us who enjoy things like Netflix or what have you, where you pay a certain amount each month, uh, you can pay a certain amount each month. I think the important thing is that there's no precise right formula, it really should be up to the individual payer and the individual developer to figure out a scheme that, that works for them, but most importantly, that allows increased patient access. That, that's really the key. So it's highly bespoke. Diane, um, if it's payment by results, when do you pay? You know, how and how do you prevent the kind of reimbursement issues that ha might happen? So, you know, a, a, a child starts a treatment and then suddenly that country decides that it's no longer going to reimburse that treatment. Um, I will answer in, in, in two layer. The first one, when you ask when you pay, um, again, because of the uncertainty and just like Paige has just say, we are no very... Um, creative with regard to way of payment and the, the basis is usually um, an outcome based uh, an outcome based uh, management agreement. Nevertheless, there are two possible scenarios. The first one uh, is uh, we pay uh, we pay as authority the full cost of the therapy at the time it is given and, and then they are refunded from the, the company. Uh, and this is uh, based on the fact that uh, it is a, a responder or a non-responder or a partial responder. And there are also some milestones that can be fixed where the reassessment is done. In the second scenario, uh, a fraction of the costs uh, is paid upfront, and then there are additional uh, payments spread over time, depending on, on of the maintenance of the therapy effect 
and the lifting of the uncertainty identified at the time of the initial decision for reimbursement. Uh, the, the initial payment could perhaps be defined on base of the value of that therapy uh, as defined at the time of uh, the uh, HTA uh, and taking it, uh, into account the level of uncertainty and the willingness to pay of the authority. Both scenarios um, require appropriate follow-up tool and data collection. They are associated with significant additional workload for the different stakeholder. Uh, and both scenario if pro and con. Uh, in the first one, company have a re rapid uh, return on investment that can be used for further uh, development, uh, but payer have a huge um, expense to face at the very beginning. As Paige mentioned, we can go for um, one of the solution that, uh, that are, is proposed to answer to that is annuity, uh, but um, as authority, we are not very well in favor of annuity because we think that uh, it simply shifts the problem um, while jeopardizing the future uh, and also letting the debt for the, the next generation, which is not what we want to do. In the, the, the second scenario, uh, as more the favor of the authority, uh, allowing to pay only for true service provided and to distribute the financial burden over time. Uh, and it also stimulates um, the order of the marketing authorization uh, to provide answer to uncertainty. But the downside is that uh, uh, it can potentially discourage innovation as the return to investment is delayed over time. The right balance still needs to be found. With regard to your question about what happened if a child started treatment, uh, which is then no longer reimbursed, I think in both scenarios, there will be no consequence for that child in the sense that uh, uh, the, the therapy was already given uh, and as such, you cannot go, go back. And um, the company will get its payment as far as the condition uh, applied in the outcome-based managing tree agreement should still apply. However, I think there are still other relevant reimbursement uh, issue concern. Um, for example, who will take in charge a retreatment if this one is needed, uh, if the therapy doesn't deliver what it was supposed to deliver? Um, what about the, the payment of other therapy in case of failure and that sort of things? So I think the best way to go forward is uh, to have early dialogue between the company on the one side and the authority on the other side to find together solution to these problems. It is deeply complex. And Andres, I, I, you know, EMA was famously the first regulatory body globally to approve an advanced therapy. You know, Europe is in a leadership uh, position. And um, do you think the, pharma the EU pharmaceutical strategy and the role of the EU in supporting patient access to innovative therapies for rare diseases, ERNs, do you think that that will continue to ensure that, the, uh, that Europe maintains this, this leading edge? I, I hope so. I mean, this is this is at least my my uh, my 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 hope, uh, and and I, I really feel we have uh, we have number of streams, you know, coming together in this moment of time. You know, you mentioned European Reference Network, already mentioned by by every, uh, earlier in the panel, huge infrastructure which is now reaching most probably up to two thousand, you know, centers uh, cooperating across across continent. Uh, we have a uh, new approach for data and the European health data space, if uh, achieve the goals, you know, also will help us, you know, with generation of data, access to data for R&D uh, part, but also for the, for the pricing reinvestment, HTA bodies and post-marketing authorization phase. And lastly, we have regulatory, uh, the willingness of, of, of develop new regulatory framework, which fits to the, to the future. So I think if we will not use this time, you know, uh, with a with a good willingness, you know, coming from from all, I think now, I think it's it's it will be bad 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 results. I, I really hope it's a it's a right moment to for all of us, you know, um, regulators, stakeholders, 
and of course patients you know really focus on the on this development but really the, the trick will be to bring all these streams together and maybe i should also mention something which is very important we have cross border uh, the, the the directive for patients right for cross border healthcare which was big achievement for for european union and I think this really give us chance to work uh, for on HDA, on, on, on digital health, on the, in the field of, of uh, health technology assessment. But now we are assessing this directive and maybe we should be also innovative here. So, so let's be open also for, for this, this point. And Amy B. Bouchoy, I mean, what's the role of the European Parliament in supporting patient access to innovative therapies? Uh, for instance, I'm thinking of the potential of the EU for Health programme. The role of uh, European Parliament, of course, is to uh, support, amend and uh, adopt in the end together with the Council uh, the right uh, legislation in order to give the right uh, incentives to the principal stakeholders uh, and, of course, uh, the industry, the academia, the professor, the researchers, in order to develop uh, these uh, therapies. And uh, that's why Horizon Europe has an appropriate budget. There, the idea of uh, innovation and innovative uh, therapies is very strong uh, emphasized. Uh, and uh, of course, we should focus on this in the, in the coming years. u for health program is for the first time in the history of European Union, a genuine uh, program uh, for health, not only because uh, the budget uh, is uh, significant, uh, 5.1 billion, comparing with uh, the previous programs where the budget was around 400 million, uh, the improvement is, uh, is very clear. And also the objectives, the ambitions are uh, much higher than the previous programs. Uh, in order to be better prepared for future crises, that's why will build uh, a strategic reserve of uh, medicine, of drugs, of medical devices, but also of personnel uh, to make uh, and to contribute that uh, our, EU, our health systems in the EU countries should become more efficient and more resilient. And here, of course, when you talk about efficiency, the ATMP is uh, crucial because uh, uh, these therapies are concentrated to mainly to the cause of a disease. And uh, here in the strategies that were, they, will be, they will be built also with the help of you for health uh, funds for the future, for the reform of the health, sect, health uh, 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 systems, uh, for the improvement, for uh, uh, making them more resilient. As I said, uh, it, we should focus on innovative therapies and uh, advanced therapies. Uh, and of course, uh, EU for Health will give a strong signal and a significant support in terms of funds for the digitalization of the health sector. Uh, Director Rees uh, mentioned earlier uh, the idea of creating, uh, the, the ambition of creating uh, an European uh, digital uh, health space and uh, with the digital solution and the digitalization of our health system and also digital solutions in, uh, uh, in many of uh, the treatments that we are doing, uh, e-health solutions, uh, telemedicine, uh, this will also go hand in hand with the advanced therapies. So in all these uh, directions of you for health the ATMPs and uh, the advanced therapies uh, could fit and could be supported. Thank you so much. We've run out of time, except I must just say to Ilona, because you're a regulator, have you been worked to death during COVID? And do you feel that you're going to have to put on a lot more staff in order to um, you know, cope with all these advanced therapies? Just a single word, yes or no? Yes, we've been overworked. <laughs> With the COVID products and everything else that is ongoing, because obviously our contribution to pharma strategy and high level things is also required. So it's not just the routine of assessment. Right. 
we're all we're all cheering for regulators at the moment and they're being uh, strengthened so uh thank you very much to our panel i um, so appreciate you all coming along uh today and we only just scratched the surface it's a huge huge topic and as you can uh, as you've heard every single product is different and requires different strategies so and of course a huge underpinning of uh, healthcare uh, infrastructure. I'm going to ask you all on the, uh, uh, in our audience that same question that I asked at the beginning. So can we just have that poll question up again? Uh, do you think that cell and gene therapies are on the cusp of realizing their promise for patients? Just very quickly, yes, no, or unsure. And has that answer changed since we started our conversation, I wonder? You were voting 63% yes in first, unsure 21% uh, and 17% no. So are you going to change uh, your mind, I wonder? That's interesting, slightly more no. Uh, just let me see whether I can... Oh, 80%. So actually a lot more of you, um, I think possibly some more of you have joined the <laughs> joined since we first started because the numbers don't quite add up there. But uh, that's interesting and good to know that you're so uh, enthusiastic. Um, one more thing I'm going to ask you to do, and I'm going to ask you to, what you, our audience, think of the future, uh, what the future holds. What's your biggest hope or, or dream? I want you to contribute just three words. If you only want to do one, you can do just one. But up to three words about what your hopes are for the future. So it could be fantastic or it could be terrible, but just three words. Okay, so let's have, and here you see them all coming up. So as uh, you see these words coming up, we come to a close. I want to thank all our speakers for participating. Thank you to all those who've been watching and listening. And a recording of the webinar will be available shortly on the uh, EHFG website. And look out on the EF, uh, EHFG, Interrail and CSL bearing social media sites for further outcomes. And I'm delighted to say there's going to be a series of podcasts, which I'll be hosting on this topic over the summer. So keep your eyes peeled for more information. And on that, I'm going to say goodbye to you all. Thank you for listening and watching.